Regalin mayum yete chamar tu ya filio filio vene kamo tu sana. Fest, si non t'ha cattu sciuro, figlio, mamma, regalino meglio, miete c'ha mano doia, figlio. Vene kamo tu sana, o kanarona, filio. Thank you for being with us tonight. It's a very special night for me and uh, for people who have been involved in this long process of writing my book, Healing Journeys with the Black Madonna. It's really a pleasure also to be back at NYU where I started my career when I was in my 20s, back in 1979. And then from there, we became artists in residence here through the Italian departments. So we're back uh, where we started from, <laughs> in the circle of life. And it's also really special for me because for the first time in New York, I am able to share this night with one of my mentors, visionary, and amazing writer, best-selling author, Reverend Dr. Matthew Fox, who came from San Francisco. <laughs> for me, it's important uh, to acknowledge him because he believed in my book and many things opened magically after uh, he came in with this special blessing, a very powerful man. <laughs> So uh, we began with a chant that is dedicated to the mother. So the book is dedicated to the mother, the universal mother, the black Madonna, the origin of life, and also to my mother, who was a very special woman, Elvira Rossetti, and also to all the mothers, because that's where we come from. So the black Madonna symbolizes many things, especially the darkness is the womb of the mother. My journey began back in 1980, studying this folk music to bring it back, especially to NYU, to write operas. And in the south of Italy, I traveled all over in very remote areas. And in all these beautiful churches, I never saw white Madonnas, but I only saw black statues or dark brown icons. And I was really moved by them. I couldn't explain the power they had on me. Their eyes were full of compassion, austerity, and I felt this unconditional love and a lot of messages every time I looked at them. Also, what was really incredible was that all these processions for them are done with drumming, singing, chanting, trance dances all night long. And they seemed very African. And then, of course, it made a lot of sense because that Black Madonna also represents the African mother. So we will take a little journey with the music together. Uh, the music is also part of my book. And each chapter has a song and a prayer. So for my, my intention is to share this knowledge, 
that has been very private for 35 years now with the world so people can learn how to honor her in this time of danger. We really need her protection. <laughs> Thank you. And one place where I learned a lot, and I know there's a friend of mine, John Migliori, another supporter from my board of directors, Calabria, right? Isn't that a special place? So a lot of things happen in Calabria. One of the things is that I learned there how people go in a trance using drumming and dancing the tarantella. And this is a chant I learned from the Black Madonna from Seminar, Our Lady of the Poor. Vignuti lunga via. Vignuti lunga via, ti saluta Maria, vignuta sogna ca, questa razza per carità. E nu mi mobo di ca, si sta razza non ma fa, Facitilo Maria e facitilo piccarita. Vignuti lunga via, ti saluta Maria, vignuta su mia capa, questa razza è carità, e non mi muovo di qua, questa razza non mi va, facciti lo Maria, facci la piccarità. Vigno di lunga via, ti saluta Maria, vigno da sogna ca, per sta razza e carità, e non mi muovo di ca, per sta razza non mi fa, faciti lo Maria, faci la piccarità. Vignuti lunga via, vi saluta Maria, vignuta su mia capa, sta razza è carità, e non mi muovo di qua, sta razza non mi fa, faciti lo Maria, facci la piccarità. Thank you. <laughs> Grazie. <clears throat> so these chants, as you can hear, are not the typical prayer you would think people are doing in a Catholic country during Mass. They're really different. So when I went to these beautiful places, always in nature, I just came back from Calabria, the nature is beautiful. So all these churches, these white, uh, usually white Romanesque or Baroque churches are in nature, either on a sacred mountain, by the sea, or by a lake. And that's the first thing you feel, is the power of nature. And that's where I realized how connected is the Black Madonna to the Earth Mother, who is alive. And a lot of these miracles that happen, still happen, I believe very much they happen because of the healing power of the earth and the sacred waters. In my uh, research, which uh, became an obsession after a while, <laughs> every time I asked the priest, ma perché la Madonna è nera? Their answer was, why is she black? È nera perché è nera. Or, it's the candle smoke, which is a joke, obviously, and Matthew Fox knows that, that answer is a very strange answer, people still give you that, and that's where I realized that the Catholic Church was really hiding something much deeper, and in my research I saw that all of these beautiful places were originally temples to different goddesses, many different goddesses, from Anatolia, the goddess of the moon, Diana Efesina, or uh, Cibele, also originally from Anatolia, Hecate, from the goddess of the underworld, Aphrodite, but the most important and the one that's most complex and embraces them all, Isis from Egypt. Therefore, there, there is a connection also to Africa. 
And then Madonna then came to me to show me who she really was when I was very ill and I had a cancerous condition. And after the surgery, when I woke up, I had this very strong vision of a beautiful black Madonna over my bed, stretching out her hands, telling me that I had to follow her path and that I was supposed to feel other people's pain and the pain of the earth. So this is all part of my book or the introduction. At that time, I didn't understand what that really meant, but I began this research to write an opera, The Voyage of the Black Madonna, which was first performed in 1991. And in this research, then, I spent a lot of time in Naples, in the region of Campania, and uh, there, was, there are these so many layers of legends and mysticism, esoteric studies, but one important one that I discovered in Naples is this, uh, the sacred mountain of La Madonna Nera Mamma Schiavona of Monte Vergine, the Virgin Mountain, was also a sacred place to the poet Virgil, and most people that study him in his classical, uh, in classical studies may not study the esoteric uh, aspect of Virgil, but in Naples it is very well known. And there I found out that he, had a, that he was devoted to the goddess of the earth, Cibele, initiated in her mysteries. And it's a great book. People who speak Italian can buy it. Roberto De Simone wrote Il Segno di Virgilio. And it's hard to find, but it's an amazing book where he it describes his magic powers, the fact that Virgil was a mago poeta, a shaman, and a healer. And he got inspiration also on this sacred mountain. And in Naples, they still worship Virgil. They bring flowers to his tomb in Piedi Grotta, and they worship him as the sun god. So this chant to the sun, Yeshe Sole, is connected to the legend of Virgil. Yes, Sole, scagliente imperatore, scagliente mio d'argento, cobale 400, 150, tutta la notte canta, canta viola, lu mastro de scola, mastro, mastro, manna mena lanza, caggia ir in Francia, dalla Francia a Lombardia, dove sa Marama Lucia, non chiovere, non chiovere, caccia ir a muovere, muovere lu grano, de mastro Giuliano, non chiovere, non chiovere, esce, esce, sole. Yes, 
So now I want to call on stage my very beautiful and talented dancers. Dancers. <laughs> they went to the sacred mountain. We're going to uh, continue with the legends, especially from Naples. So one of the most common legends in uh, the regional Campania. And then as you travel south, if you follow my pilgrimage, you'll see that people will tell you that there are seven Madonnas, there are seven sisters. And the last one was believed to be the ugliest, so she ran away to a high mountain to hide, so that people had to search really hard to find her. When they found her, they saw indeed that she was the most beautiful of all, and she was black, so they called her Mamma Schiavona, the serving mother the nurturing mother. So this is a place where I spend a lot of time uh, not only doing research, but going through the process of understanding what the place is spectacular, the mountain is beautiful, the nature is incredible, the air is super clean, but there is an energy there that is hard to describe, and it's always there is this fog around the sanctuary, and there is this famous uh, rock, which is called La Sejara Maronna, if anybody speaks Neapolitan, it's a little funny in Neapolitan, which means the throne of the Madonna. And it's a beautiful rock where you can sit and ask for healing. And you can see the legend says that the Madonna rested and she put her feet up and there is an imprint there of her feet. So these places are all magical. They all have incredible phenomena that you can't scientifically explain. And there is where I had a lot of revelations, especially of the earth vibrating and being alive. So this chant that we're going to do comes from Monte Vergine, when it was a sacred uh, place to the goddess Cibele, where Virgil spent time. And they honored the goddess in pre-Christian times, just like they do today, with beautiful chanting, all night long, walking up the mountain, asking for miracles, and then coming out and doing the party, the tamuriata, which is a very wild drumming party, a very sensual dance. And because it goes back to these ecstatic or jastic rites, the lyrics are all about sex. And this uh, Madonna is also interesting because she's a protector of gays and transgender from way back because men who honored Cibele became women. And today they were known as Galli, today they're known as Femminielli. So in these feasts, you will see a lot of amazing things happening during this dance. And here is Canto della Madonna di Monte Vergine. Near Avellino, is anyone knows this chant in the audience? Usually the old women remember it. Please sing along. E salim su montagnoni E amma truva Mamma schiavona E amma truva Mamma schiavona cantare che bello occhio te la maronna e ma parone doi e sella e ma parono doi e sella doi e sella illuminata mamma mia sei incurunata mamma mia Sain Kuruna E Kututta Stagu Pania Satapane Marana Mia Satapane Marana Mia Satapane Marana Mia Elana Kabane Turna ma beni Elana Kabane Turna ma beni Si ma chiude 
si ma panuna, quante grazie che vi ma budo, quante grazie che vi ma budo. Bella figliola cate che a me rosa, bella figliola cate che a me rosa, che bello nome mamma, che bello nome mai, che bello nome mamma, me tu da mi so, Dammi su un nome bello degli rose, dammi su un nome bello degli rose, un meglio sciore vuoi mo veni e iammela, un meglio sciore cam, san paraviso, yeah, ah, yeah, ah, 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 chi le vo fa vo fa vo fa. E lo mare vive nel trichin trachin cravo nell'ubiglia a mano posa in terra c'è un lecce nella rinta rinnira bonne Chi le vuoi fa, vuoi fa, vuoi fa, Toppo lietto, sotto lietto, chi le vuoi fa? Francesca Silvano, Daniel Hartman, Marina Zelenovic. I feel like this is the perfect time to call uh, Matthew Fox uh, because in this area where we just honor Cibele, the goddess of the earth, and all these wild rituals for the Earth Mother, is also the area sacred to the goddess Isis. A lot of people don't know that, but Napoli was a center of, for Isis. All that area called Irpinia, known for the magic and the witches of Benevento, was a settlement of the Egyptians. Temples of Isis still exist in the cathedral of Benevento. And there is a very important Madonna there that I'm devoted to. I'll tell you more later, a Madonna della Libera. I know Matthew Fox, like me, believes strongly in the healing power of Isis. <laughs> so I would like to call you up and and uh, please join my <laughs> sp 
special night. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> Welcome to the Casa Italiana. <laughs> How does this work? Okay. Good. Good evening. It's a special uh, honor. Is this on now? Okay. Good. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, I'm impressed that uh, the Casa Italiana at New York University are uh, happy and eager to be sponsoring this common event in the name of uh, the Black Madonna. And um, I, I was thinking how many Catholic churches are, um, are stumbling over each other trying to invite the Black Madonna in these days. You know, they might get a little more life going on there and a few younger people if uh, they were as willing as New York University is to sponsor a thing like this. It's kind of a scandal, really, that uh, organized religion is so afraid of the Black Madonna. It's a pretty good sign for the Black Madonna that, uh, that she's threatening. And she does do that. There's a fierceness to the Black Madonna. There's a fierceness there. Like there is to Kali in the East. And Kali is the Black Madonna of the East. And the Guadalupe is the Brown Madonna, the cousin of the Black Madonna in, uh, in South America, in Central America. And uh, it's really exciting, I think, that at this crucial time in human history and planetary history, so many species threatened with extinction and so forth, that the archetype of the Black Madonna is coming back and coming back strongly. For years, I've met all kinds of people who've had dreams of the Black Madonna. Uh, some of them Christian, some of them not Christian. Uh, people of all races and nationalities, uh, she's coming back, and it's pretty obvious why. Because the Earth as we know it, this amazing planet with this amazing creatures of so many sorts, is, uh, is being threatened. As you know, this past year, a, a serious scientific study published by the United Nations, but it involved over 200 scientists, said that if we, our species, cannot change its ways the next 10 to 12 years, you know, we are essentially uh, digging our own extinction. There's this movement led by young people in Europe called Extinction Rebellion. I love that name. Isn't it? Don't you think we ought to rebel against extinction? How many people want to rebel against extinction? <laughs> huh? How many people don't want to rebel against extinction? So, you know, we have to conjure up all our, our imagination, our powers, our spiritual traditions to make this happen, to turn things around. I think that from this time on, we should all meditate on, since we're told we have 12 years left, on 13 years from today. Add 13 years to your, to your age. And then look back. Look back to today. Look back to Casa Italiana and the Black Madonna to this day and ask, what have we done? What could we have done to make a difference? Because our species can get so detoured by so many distractions. But surely there's no greater issue today than uh, the survival of Gaia, our Earth Mother. And this is where the Black Madonna comes in. You know, um, Marion Woodman, the Jungian analyst who lives in Toronto, she says this about archetypes. She says, think of your favorite song or your favorite painting. Think about what it does for you, how it turns you on. She said, that is about a thousand volts, your favorite painting, your favorite uh, 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 music. She says, an archetype is a hundred thousand volts. <laughs> I just think that's so funny. Hundred thousand volts. It's like sitting in an electric chair. But that's what an archetype does, she says. It literally turns you on. It literally releases a kundalini energy, the elect 
spectral energy that we carry throughout our chakras and throughout our bodies and psyches. So it's not a small thing to say, oh, the archetype of the Black Madonna is back. No, that's 100,000 votes that are standing on this stage <laughs> and singing and drumming and dancing and calling us to wake up. One of the images of, the black, of the Isis, which is, of course, the origin of the Black Madonna, is that she, she's often uh, pictured with a headdress that is, in fact, a bell. So she's wearing a bell on her head, not around her neck, but on her head. What's that about? It's about waking people up and institutions up. And of course, institutions don't wake up unless people wake up. <laughs> and we have to wake up to know when it's time to bury our institutions, to let them go. Didn't Jesus say, let the dead bury the dead? That's the most, one of the most radical statements that Jesus ever uttered. Because in the Jewish tradition, like in the Muslim tradition, you're supposed to bury your dead, you know, in 24 hours. After all, it's very hot in, in, the, Middle, in the Middle East. But he says, let the dead bury the dead. That, you know, that just shows what a, what a naughty person he was. He was deconstructing the, the cultural uh, shibboleths. And so we too, we have to be able to discern between life and death. And uh, we have to be able to smell, and it's not that hard, when patriarchy, for example, is crushing people's souls, crushing our institutions, and crushing the earth herself. And that means all the creatures of the earth. Our generation, you know, I, I met with a Stanford scientist, very renowned guy, a few years ago, and he said this to me. He's, he's a biologist. He said, you know, we are the first species in four and a half billion years of this planet, think about that, the first that can choose not to go extinct. Then he added, but of course we haven't made that choice yet. And that was about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Well, that's what's facing us today, folks. That's what's facing us. And the reason the black banana archetype is back is to wake us up and shake us up and empower us to put life first, to put eros first, to put wisdom first. So much of our education in the West is not about wisdom. We gave up on wisdom centuries ago. It's about knowledge. We have all these knowledge factories and very few wisdom schools. Wisdom, of course, is feminine. She's feminine in the Bible. She's feminine around the world. And it is when patriarchy took over education that we banished wisdom and, uh, and went just for knowledge, which is, of course, raw power. Now, knowledge is a good thing, but it's not the whole picture. And so the return of the divine feminine is, is one of the most important movements of our, of our time, to bring gender balance back and to bring a, a critique of masculinity. Because what we're calling masculine today is toxic. It's not good for men, it's not good for women, it's certainly not good for children, and it's not good for Mother Earth. <clears throat> it's, it's a reptilian brain gone amok. The reptilian brain is all about I win, you lose. Reptilian brain's about being number one. That's how reptiles are, you know. They, it's, you don't compromise when you're wrestling with a crocodile, you know. It's, it's win-lose, it's win-lose. Now how do we tame this reptilian brain? You tame it by meditation. Because reptiles aren't real good at bonding. It's not their thing. Like a lot of them eat their kids. So they're not real good at bonding, but they're very good at lying in the sun. They're very good at solitude. They're monks. The word monk comes from monos, solitude, being alone. Now, we all have a monk inside of us. We all have a need for solitude. Creative people know this. And this is part of what the Black Madonna 
is speaking to us about. Because the darkness she represents is the letting go of noise, not being afraid of the dark, going into the deeper places, which are places beyond words. And that is why I already say there are only two languages for mysticism. One is silence, and the other is art. Art is an alternative language. When you're talking, whether you're talking dance or theater, film, pottery, music, poetry, is taking us beyond the world of everyday words, which are the accomplishment of the left brain, into the right hemisphere of the brain, which is where intuition happens, and as Einstein says, where values happen. So part of what the Black Madonna is doing for us is rattling, rattling this cage of uncritically accepted values. That Einstein says, you know, he says we've been given two gifts. The gift of rationality, what I'd call our left brain, and the gift of intuition, or deep feeling, which are the same thing, he says. He says, the first gift should serve the second. The first gift into uh, rationality should serve the second. But we live in a society that honors the first and ignores the second. The role of intuition, the role of what darkness has to teach us, the role of the arts, of creativity. You know, when there's a budget crunch in education, which there always is, I'm speaking now of children, out goes the theater department, out goes music, out goes art. That's just an example of what Einstein is saying. He said, this is a quote, I abhor American education, says Einstein. Why? Because it's not value-oriented, because values come from the right brain. They come from our intuition and our mysticism. They do not come from the intellectual side. He says, do not overvalue the intellect. It does not give you values. It gives you methods, which are useful, but it should serve the bigger picture. And I think all of this is what the return of, of the divine feminine is about. And, um, and, and what the healing of the masculine is about. Re recovering the sacred masculine. And it was in my book on the sacred masculine that I call The Hidden Spirituality of Men, 10 Metaphors, meaning 10 Archetypes, to Awaken the Sacred Masculine, that I, I ended that book with the sacred marriage of the divine and the uh, the divine feminine and sacred masculine. And I even proposed that we should have a ritual of the green man, which is a fine archetype of the healthy masculine. It's about defending Mother Earth, and it's about men getting in touch with their generativity and their creativity and their sensuality within a context, the bigger context of what Mother Earth is calling for. So I called for a, a ritual to marry the green man and the black Madonna. Because the Black Madonna represents so much of the depths of ourselves. Meister Eckhart, who's my favorite mystic of the West, and was also condemned by a bad pope uh, in his day, in the uh, 14th century, um, he, uh, he used to say, the ground of the soul is dark. The ground of the soul is dark. So if you want to go deep, call on the Black Madonna to lead us into that darkness. It's not just the ground of the soul is dark. Think about it. The ground of the ocean is dark. You go deep into the ocean, it's dark down there. The ground of the soil is dark. And the ground of space is dark. I've talked to some astronauts, and they, you know, they went up there. Most of them were jet fighter pilots or something, and they got hired to go into space. And they came back mystics. And I sat down and I figured out what it cost to turn these jet fighter pilots into mystics. It cost about $42 million. <laughs> you know, figure, th there, has to be a, there has to be a shortcut to this. You know. <laughs> but, um, but I talked to them and I said, you know, what happened to you up there? And they all said the same thing, the silence of space and the darkness of space. And looking back to the shining home that we call Earth, seeing it against the backdrop of the utter darkness of space. This is what flipped them. It flipped them. And 
This too is part of what the, the black banana represents. She represents the cosmos. The divine feminine is always about the cosmos. Wisdom is about the cosmos. Think of the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible. Um, I was by, by God's side, a master craftsperson, playing with God day after day, um, loving to be in the presence of the, of the, um, of the human race. And um, I was there at the beginning of creation. So the, the Black Madonna and the Divine Feminine have a cosmic context. And that is so important today because we can get so bogged down in our strife, our little battles that we make against one another, it, our tribalism, whether it's racial division or sectarianism or religious division or something like that. Get the bigger picture. That is what the black banana is bringing, the bigger picture. That, and now, today, science is giving us this amazing new creation story that all of us can learn from, that it took us 13.8 billion years to get here, and that 60% of your body was cooked in the original fireball. So 60% of you, your hydrogen and helium atoms, are 13.8 billion years old, which is why you may need a, a nap once in a while. You know. <laughs> and the rest of us, the new part of us, is uh, 4.5 billion years old or so. The, those are our recent atoms, like carbon and magnesium and sulfur and so forth. So. Um, we all have this story, and by we, I don't mean every human being, I mean every critter we encounter on this planet. The trees, the, the flowers, the elephants, the tigers, the polar bears, the whales, the fishes, the forests, all of which are threatened today, all of which are threatened today because humans have lost, or too many humans, the dominant humans, the dominant cultures have lost this awareness, this connection, this consciousness with the, the divine feminine, with the um, story of the wisdom that unfolds in a cosmic context. So the Black Madonna speaks to many, many uh, layers of what it means to be human. And obviously, one reason she's returning is that people of color, which are two-thirds of the world's people or more on the planet, are waking up and coming into their own empowerment and have a need to do that, to bring their wisdom to the table. And of course, the return of, of the Divine Feminine is of course an empowerment of women. We can see what good things are happening in our culture today when women start to lead in politics and don't leave it all up to men. And, uh, and this is just the beginning. So all this, I think, is, is, is uh, part of the, the, uh, the story of what the black banana has to teach us today. And I think what, um, what uh, Alessandra has done is so special. Uh, her book is not about reading a lot of documents in libraries, although that's there too. But primarily, as she has said and even demonstrated tonight, it is about her pilgrimages over the years, over the decades, to these areas where the, the memory of the Black Madonna was not lost. And of course, it's no coincidence that these areas in southern Italy are just a hop, skip, and jump from Africa. But of course, we know the black banana is found in Russia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Switzerland, Germany, France, Spain. And uh, she's gotten pretty far. But that, that Alessandra, her, her story is so richly told in this book because she talks about the healing. She talks about the rituals. And, um, and she talks about the the stories that have been carried on for generations about the black men that have not been lost. And as she said tonight, I think it's very interesting that, you know, that the, the church has been sitting on, on this uh, for a long time. And, um, and that's one reason the church, as we know it, is dying and deserves to die. Because um, 
um, you know, you don't turn your back on that kind of power and expect to be on an authentic path of depth and of that challenges a culture's uh, suppositions. A friend of mine, um, Javier Garcia Limos, who's from El Salvador and lives in the Bay Area where I live, um, he did a marvelous painting, it's, it's the cover of my recent book, of the cosmic black Madonna. And he himself had an experience. He was 15 years old and he was swimming with his father in the ocean uh, in Salvador, El Salvador, and uh, his father had a heart attack. And he um, held his father, but his father died in his arms and threw up and all this. And then um, the current was so strong, he had to let go of his father, and he himself got sucked under. And he said he was falling, falling, falling into the darkness of the ocean. He was drowning. And he called on Mary. He called on the Black Madonna, and he shot up like that. Just shot up, and he lived. He's here to talk about it still. So he painted this painting, which is amazing. It's nine feet by three feet. It's on recycled plastic that he found in the street. And, uh, but he calls it the, the Cosmic Lapidana. So it sports the cover of my most recent book, which is on Naming the Unnameable, 89 Wonderful and Useful Names for God, including the Unnameable God. <laughs> and one whole section is on the, the Divine Feminine. Uh, as, as God and goddess, of course, because uh, uh, that's what the goddess is about. It's another dimension to divinity. And, um, and one of those, number 64, is the Black Madonna. But I just want to point out to you, this is just one, one example of where the Black Madonna has intervened into a person's life and made a profound difference, that he's never lost that uh, connection. In fact, he painted this amazing painting to honor and to remember. This is what artists help us to do, to remember uh, what matters. To remember what matters. And I think that this is what uh, Alessandra is doing in her book, that she's calling us. You know, my mentor, uh, I studied in Paris with um, Pierre Chenou. He was a 75-year-old French Dominican uh, when I studied with him, a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. It was his last year of, of formal teaching and um, one thing he used to say was, <laughs> he said, I do not do theology for my armchair. And I really like that phrase. He, he's really the grandfather of liberation theology. He worked with the worker priest movement in the 1940s with Marxists after the war in France. And for that reason, he was silenced by Pope Pius XII for 12 years, forbidden to publish. But in the Second Vatican Council, he was brought in by a, a third world bishop from Madagascar, actually who brought him in as his paritas, his theological uh, um, um, coach. And, uh, and a lot of his work was, was uh, brought into the Second Vatican Council. But I love that line, that he didn't do theology from an armchair. Therefore, he got in trouble. He was silenced for 12 years. And he didn't do theology from an academic um, pedestal. He was working with the Marxist uh, uh, workers after the Second World War, and, and of course in France there were a lot of those. And he would attend the, the, uh, the union meetings, he would sit in the back, he was the most educated guy in the room, and at the end of the meeting they would say, Father Chenu, what did you just hear? Feedback what you heard from us. That's the methodology that later became liberation theology. That, that base communities, ordinary people, the ordinary workers, they experience wisdom all the time, but no one's ever asking them what they've got to, to say. So I think in many ways, Alessandra parallels Perchenou for me because she's not talking about the black banana just by gathering footnotes and quoting people. She's out there doing it. She's leading the rituals. And ritual is in so many ways the gathering of all the arts. It's a gathering of all the arts. And ritual is one of the most important um, uh, graces that humans have to change things and change them quickly. Uh, I've been involved in trying to, for example, create what we call the cosmic mass, which is an alternative form of the mass in so far as instead of sitting in benches, we dance. We bring in rave, we bring in VJs and, and, and uh, 
DJs and rap and so forth, taking these new languages, these new art forms, postmodern art forms, but still um, creating a space, a sacred space, that in fact follows uh, the deepest um, um, template of, uh, of, of, Christian, uh, of Christian worship. We did one, for example, in November at the World Parliament in Toronto. And we had 500 people there. There were Buddhist monks and there were Jewish rabbis and all, all kinds of people. And this has happened a, a lot of places where we've done this kind of ritual. Often we've, we have had the Black Madonna as the theme of, our, of a ritual. Our theme last time was our sacred earth because I think this is kind of what we have to conjure up. But again, the Black Madonna represents grief. We always have grieving when we do our worship services because grieving is so important today. I think there are only two people on the planet today, two kinds of people, one who are grieving and know it, and the others are grieving and don't know it yet. We all, at some level of our psyche and metabolism, we know we're carrying this loss that is staring us in the face. We are living in the greatest extinction spasm since the dinosaurs disappeared 65 billion years ago. And our species, more than any other cause, is responsible for this. This is the moment we live in. The other day I was invited to speak on the Pope's encyclical Laudate Si on the environment um, and on our new movement, the Order of the Sacred Earth, uh, at a Sierra Club gathering. And um, who shows up but Joanna Macy, who just had her 90th birthday, the Buddhist teacher and a wonderful human being. And, um, and they gave her the mic for a few minutes. And there were two scientists speaking and, and me, and then, but, but she was there, so they gave her the mic for a few minutes. 90-year-old woman, she stands up and she says, <laughs> after all this, the, the scientists, of course, are pretty dire about the facts and all that stuff. And she stands up and she says, isn't it a privilege to be alive today? Isn't it a privilege to be alive today? It is. It is. We've been empowered to be witnesses to this great unveiling of evil. Yeah, that's happening at this time, unmasking of evil. Carl Jung said that the, the age of Aquarius, which is the age we're in, will be characterized Evil will no longer be under the table. It will be on top of the table, visible to everybody. The question will be, will we have the will to deal with it? And this is where, again, the Black Madonna and the Divine Feminine and the renewed Sacred Masculine comes in. That at our deepest levels, we have been taught by our ancestors that yes, we are ready. We are capable. Every spiritual leader from all the world traditions comes down to one thing, our capacity for compassion. The Dalai Lama says, we can do away with all religion, but we can't do away with compassion. Compassion is my religion, he says, representing, of course, Buddhism. What Jesus says in Luke 6, be you compassionate like your creator in heaven is compassionate. And he got that from his Jewish ancestors, and in the Jewish tradition, compassion is the secret name for God. The secret name for God. The mystery of mysteries. And the word compassion in both Hebrew and Arabic comes from the word for womb. So compassion itself is part of the maternal energy that the Black Madonna uh, represents and is here to shake us up about. So these are just a few reflections on why I'm excited to be here and honored uh, to celebrate Alessandra's book, to celebrate the fact that uh, you're here at New York University and the wonderful uh, Casa Italiana is supporting this. But realize that what we're talking about, this has to go deep into our culture today. It has to um, penetrate. But I'm convinced people are ready for it. Young people are ready for it. Men are ready for it. And certainly women are ready for it. And uh, we, should, we cannot be shy. The Black Banana, she's, she's strong. And she's urging us to deepen our courage. Deepen our courage. To get strong. Time's running out. 
meditate on that 13-year thing and look back and ask how you can contribute, how the Black Madonna is speaking to you. I just started, launched on Mother's Day, a daily meditations. It's for free, and you can check it out. But the third one was on the Black Madonna. And we had this picture and some others and so forth. But the point is that um, I think that we can simplify our spiritual practices. And we have to. I say we have to travel not with basilicas on our back, but backpacks, spiritually speaking today. And um, uh, we need shortcuts that take us deep that tame that reptilian brain and allow the mammal brain, which is a compassionate brain, because it is the mammal brain, uh, to come forward. And I think the Black Madonna is involved in all this, this stirring up, all this energy. And uh, I wish you well, I wish all of us well, in making these wildfires burn. Make these wildfires burn. Thomas Aquinas says, a great Italian, he says, the fire that Jesus came to set on the earth is compassion. The fire that Jesus came to set on the earth is compassion. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> That's not an easy act to follow. <laughs> well, what you say is so deep, so it goes obviously through me and through a lot of people. I convey it through music, but I believe everything you say. And thank you for helping uh, waking up the world. Because I feel like you in my dreams. Unfortunately, there are more and more often that we don't have much time left. And that's been my calling with the Black Madonna. I speak about that in the book, too. So talking about ritual, you need to chant with us before we do our, our songs. It's a chant to do Our Lady of Freedom, La Madonna della Libera, in this beautiful town called Moiano, near Benevento, the magic area. There was uh, an ancient Egyptian settlement and uh, worship to the goddess Isis. I found this Madonna. I thought by accident, but it wasn't an accident. I thought we were lost with my ex-husband, who needed a miracle very badly, suffering from addiction. And we had this miracle when we found this black Madonna in the church. Um, we didn't know uh, what was going to happen to us. We were just there thinking we had been lost. There is the most beautiful statue coming to us. And she has a crown, gold crown with 12 stars and we saw the center star move and really greeting us. And for a while we were speechless, we had no idea what was happening. And then we realized it was a miracle as we were asking her to free him. And it really happened and he was sober and well for many, many years. So I would like you to chant with us this chant. Some people may know it already because in my devotion with him was to go back every year on September 8th to her feast. Uh, to celebrate Our Lady of Freedom, La Madonna della Libera, also known as Brunettella, the little dark one. Very miraculous. So one is called Eviva Maria. You can simply repeat it with us. Eviva Maria. Maria Eviva. Maria Eviva. And then Ave Maria. Okay. You can sing with me, yes? <laughs> and then the second part is Madonna della Libera. Regina dell'anima mia. Regina dell'anima mia. Quanto è bella chiamare Maria. Our Lady of Freedom, Queen of my soul, it is so beautiful to call upon you, Mary. E viva Maria. Maria, 
Eviva, you can harmonize. Eviva, Maria, Maria, Eviva, Ave, 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 Maria, Ave, Ave, Ave. Maria, Eviva, Maria, Maria, Eviva, Eviva, Maria, Maria, Eviva, Ave, Ave. Ave Maria, Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. Madonna della Libera, Regina dell'anima mia, Regina dell'anima mia è qua, te bella chiamare Maria. Madonna della libera, regina dell'anima mia, regina dell'anima mia è qua, te bella chiamare Maria. Grazie, I can see her smiling. When I sing this, I can see this very beautiful statue, right? The one, the people who came, I lead the pilgrimage every summer, people came with me know that when we go there, some things happen, and usually everybody breaks down and cries. And she has a power of shifting, too. Her face changes because she's alive. So the next um, chant is also a prayer. It comes from, um, it's, it's in Latin, it's medieval. It comes from the Black Madonna of Montserrat in Spain, which is a sister of the Black Madonna in Calabria. And in the Middle Ages, they, they worshipped her with drumming and singing and dancing and spinning. And in Calabria, they still do that. They still worship this Black Madonna, Our Lady of the Poor, La Madonna dei Poveri, on August 14th with really powerful drumming, very African 6-8 with snare drums. You've got to come there someday, my friend. <laughs> my friend Gordon, a great drummer and percussionist who helped me in the first book, Rhythm is the Cure. And he was just a minor thing, a percussionist for the New York Philharmonic. And then he also played with us, right, Joe? So I'm very thankful to you because I learned a lot about uh, rhythm and music with you, by the way. So in this town, they don't read music, but they play and drum all for many hours, honoring the Black Madonna with a, a tradition of giant puppets with a Black King puppet that falls in love with the white Italian queen and they embrace each other and it's a beautiful tradition. But the beauty of this is they still do today what they did in the Middle Ages. And I really strongly feel that we're in the same time. A time where people live with fear, fear of death by contagious disease, fear of the end of the world, the crusades. So this prayer and this drumming and this dance, um, I firmly believe has the power to send away the fear, especially like in those times, fear of death by the plague. <laughs> Thank you. 
Cumtisimas con carentes, Ave María. 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 Virgo sola les esente, pero aquí son geritus. Gabriel es apelados, aquí de sus geritus. Para fassi y que dici, Ave María. Para fassi y que dici, Ave María. Para fassi y que dici, odite cari civi. Para fassi y que dici, odite cari civi. Inconcipies Maria, Ave Maria, Inconcipies Maria, Ave Maria. Inconcipies Maria, Adi te cari sibi, Inconcipies Maria, Adi te cari sibi, Maries cui filiu, Ave Maria, Maries cui filiu. Ave Maria Maria scolpire uva di te cari sibi Maria scolpire uva di te cari bibi O capisse un miesum Ave Maria O capisse un miesum Ave Maria Contesimos con carentes, Ave María. 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 Ave María. Ave María.
Thank you. So that was a song that I wrote for San Marie de la Mer, the Three Marys of the Sea, a fantastic location in La Camargue in France, where there is a black Madonna called Santa Sara La Cali. So she's connected to India, she's the protector of the gypsies, she represents the Mary Magdalene, another aspect of the Dark Mother and also the healing power of water because they process with her in the sea. We're at the end of our program because I know we're gonna do questions and answers, but do we have time for one more song, a prayer I wrote for my mother? Can... <laughs> All right. After this, we will be here. So the song is called Requiem. Requiem for Mamma Elvira. It's a, a prayer that I wrote when my mother passed away, and she was an amazing mother who really taught me about unconditional love and non-judgmental and the devotion to the Madonna. And actually, my book starts with that and her miracle. There are a couple of mothers I want to honor of my friends here. Gordon Gottlieb's mother that I love very much. She was another one of those mothers. And la grande signora Luisa Marchi, who passed away a short time ago. I feel a little emotional because she kind of adopted me in your family and all mothers. But these two were once I was close to great inspiration. They were part of women liberation before it ever existed, I would think, <laughs> like my mother. And those are the role models we need today. The divine feminine and arranged by Joe Dennison. Mother Day, ora pro nobis, Mater Amata, ora pro nobis, Mater Eterna, ora pro nobis. Mater Divina, ora pro nobis, grande madre, io ti ringrazio per il tuo amore universale. Riposa in pace, pace 
eterna, luce divina. Mater Dei Ora pro nobis Mater Amata Ora pro nobis Mater Eterna Ora pro nobis, Mater Divina. Ora pro nobis, Tante Madri. Io ti ringrazio. in pace pace eterna luce divina balla bata te tonna come una faccia de paloma balla bata te gira la danza della vita balla forte forte la danza della vita All'angelo della morte Ora pro nobis, mater divina, ora pro nobis, grande madre, io ti ringrazio per il tuo amore universale, grande madre, riposa in pace, pace eterna, luce divina, balla bata te torna. Faccia de paloma, balla bota de gira, la danza della vita, balla forte forte, la danza della morte, apri la porta all'angelo della morte. Ora pro nobis, ora pro nobis. Pronobis, ora pronobis, ora pronobis, ora pronobis. Grazie, thank you Joe Dennison, <laughs> and thank you to Marina Zelinovic and Francesca, and now Professor Albertini, you're going. Thank you, Alessa thank you Alessandra, uh, for the generosity Boy. with which you always give and keep giving. We have no time for the Q&A, but I want to remind everybody that there are books uh, upstairs, and Alessandra will sign them. We have a patio, a garden. 
you can relax and ask her questions, or Dr. Fox, if you want, they're going to be up Upstairs. there. But before we go, I just wanted to ask Dr. Fox to come on the stage again and maybe close with a blessing, a cosmic blessing. Yes. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to share with you this last incarnation of the Black Madonna. This is from the Washington Post. It's from a couple of days ago. This is Our Lady of Czestochowa in Poland. Yes. And the woman was arrested, was arrested uh, and risks prison term because she substituted the original golden halo of the Virgin Mary with, with the, the rainbow. For the gay. So I, I wrote my own little uh, defense line for her lawyer. I don't know whether he's ever going to listen to it. And maybe you can vouch you're more authoritative than I am. And I said, first of all, the rainbow is a beautiful creature of God, if you believe it, uh, before being any flag. Second, the rainbow was a sign of the reconciliation between humanity and God after the flood. And third, we have always, in the litanies of the Virgin Mary, she's called Federi Sarka, the Ark of the Alliance, as reminiscent of this. So there is nothing better than the rainbow as a halo. Yay! Of a black Madonna in Poland. So it, we should also support the, the cause of this woman because she's really risking seriously with the present government. So yeah. it, it means that the Black Madonna is still provoking uh, thoughts, ideas, and very forthcoming ideas. And with this, I am really asking you and Alessandra to give us a blessing. Thank you. Him. Yeah. And movements, <laughs> provoking movements. <clears throat> I was struck when Alexandra, Alessandra um, reminded us that Virgil was a shaman. Because when I took high school Latin, they didn't tell me German. Virgil was a shaman. I had to wait all these years to learn about that. Uh, because uh, that's how I see Alessandra. She's a shaman. And that's why her book is very shamanistic. It, it uh, tells the stories and the rituals and the song and all that. So everything we experienced tonight was very shamanistic. My good friend, Father Thomas Berry, who's a real prophet about ecology, who worked in New York for many years, he taught at Fordham, but then he had a center in upstate New York too. Uh, he used to say this, he said, we need, today we need fewer priests, fewer professors, and more shamans. So, <laughs> more people like Alessandra. Priest, professor, and shaman, you might be older. I'm not a priest yet. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> So why don't we all stand for a blessing then? And um, that's uh, one thing that's very clear in Alessandra's work and the work of the Black Madonna and Gaia is calling on our lower chakras. Because it is our lower chakras that connect to the earth, our lower chakras that, that recover sexuality as a celebration, and a, as a door for wisdom. And that also taps in our third chakra to our moral outrage, to authentic anger, but learns to steer it in nonviolent ways. So let's uh, call on the Black Madonna. And um, all, all images and archetypes of the Divine Feminine, and all those archetypes like the Green Man and Father Sky, spiritual warrior of the Sacred Masculine, come spirits come spirits of the feminine deep spirits of darkness deep spirits of peace deep spirits of grieving deep spirits of celebrating come come to our bodies come from the earth to our feet to our first chakras to our second chakras our sexuality to our third chakras, our moral outrage, to the fourth chakra, our heart, our green hearts, the greening power, stir this up. To our fifth chakra, our voices, that we may speak out as a prophet did, profeto means to speak out. To our sixth chakra, the marriage of our right and left hemisphere, of our intuition and our intellects. And finally, that seventh chakra, to deliver the fire, the kundalini gift, the burning of 
stupidity and folly and destruction that our species is so capable of. We ask you, Divine Mother, Divine Gifter, to guide all this fire that we may give back to future generations, many generations from today, the same beautiful and healthy and diverse earth that we once inherited. Amen. <laughs>